I'm going to share some thoughts about the curriculum that, or the idea of a curriculum that is making sense rich to help with the meaning crisis that we seem to be suffering with or suffering from. How that means changing how we analyze things so our analysis is less binary, less winner-loser, more nuanced, multi-layered, and better-natured. To do that, I think we need interpretation-focused RE. And so I've been interested in how sacred text hermeneutics matters to help learn a different way of analyzing than proof texting, which I'll say a little bit about the meaning crisis. Um, in his essay book, A Short History of Truth, Consolations for a Post-Truth World, written in 2017, Julian Beghini set out what he saw as the main problem of truth today. Our problem is not primarily with what truth means, but how and by whom truth is established. Truth used to seem simple, because it was easy to assume that most of what we thought to be true really was true, that things were as they seemed, that the wisdom passed down the generations was timeless. This simplicity has been eroded by a variety of different forces. Science shows us that much of what we think about how the world works is false, and that we are even mistaken about the workings of our own minds. The pace of its development has left us questioning whether today's orthodoxy will be tomorrow's outdated fallacy. That's all one long quote. The connection between evidence and our ability to understand is not straightforward. Serious philosophers and psychologists doubt evidence is mind independent. Atheist philosopher Thomas Nagel in The View From Nowhere written in the late 70s and published in 86, eloquently observes the difficulty of trying to gain detachment from our initial standpoint. The ambition to get outside of ourselves has obvious limits, but it's not always easy to know where they are or when they've been transgressed. Since we are who we are, we can't get outside of ourselves completely and there's no way of telling how much of reality lies beyond the reach of present or future objectivity or any other conceivable form of human understanding. Ian McGilchrist, in his latest monumental work, The Matter with Things, maintains that to cease to be mindful of questions is a grave mistake, that having ready answers means that in a sense you do not understand and that understanding means never letting go of questions. That's from page 1194 of his monumental work. <laughs> now, Beghini thinks that we might not be in a post-truth world, but we are experiencing a post-truth moment, a convulsion. The spawning of multiple forms of explanation, entirely unrelatable accounts that exist parallel to one another. This is having increasingly extreme consequences as a result. The QAnon conspiracy theory movement is reported to have been a crucial contributing factor in the events leading up to the storming of Capitol Hill in the USA in January. Tens of thousands of Americans believe Democrats are led by blood drinking devil worshippers. In the UK, conspiracy theories are a concern for public health. The deadly danger of COVID-19 was not enough to deter a growth of anti-vaccination networks, including the most distressing outright denials of the numbers dying. We hear sad accounts of unvaccinated people dying in hospitals, regretting their belief in alternative truths. How should we be educating pupils to endure this post-truth convulsion? a making sense rich curriculum. My daughter came home from her secondary school. She said, I did the Big Bang twice this week. On Monday, I did it in, re in, in religion. On Wednesday, in physics. I asked her if she thought one department knew 
that the other was also touching on the Big Bang. She didn't think so. I asked if she would show me her work from each class. In the physics book was writing that stated information about discovery of redshift and the development of the theory of the Big Bang. It appeared much as the rest of the contents of the book, from what I could tell. This is how it was discovered. This is how it is. Her religion book had an informative photocopied handout with some information that was the same, but this was complemented by a different type of material. Information about how different Christian and Muslim people held different beliefs about their origins, including different interpretations about narratives, their sacred texts, and how they connected or were connected to scientific theories and doctrines. The religion book linked the authoritative mainstream science understanding with sacred text authority and stated both that religious people navigated this and that they came to differing conclusions. The pupil travels from subject to subject, classroom to classroom, presented with different content collections and different ways of organising that content. Sometimes the content is common between two or indeed more subjects. NISA, my research centre's TWCF funded Science Religion Encounters project is part of a family of projects called Big Questions in the Classroom. Our study investigated beginning RE and science teachers, primary and secondary. Those in the training and the first two or three years in the classroom. And it had focus groups and then a survey, which almost a thousand teachers engaged with, student teachers, teachers engaged with across the country. One element of the project found how teachers describe the relationship of science and religion. Now, there's been a decline in the old binary picture of one versus the other. And the data from our project indicates that teachers see the relationship as one of independence, perhaps coexistence, perhaps nothing to do with one another. In one focus group of RE teachers, two different messages emerged. One was expressed by a philosophy graduate. He said RE should understand the superiority of the kind of scientific reasoning offered in science. Reasoning and rationality mattered most when it came to making sense, and arguments based on faith were insufficient. Another message was expressed by a social scientist. She saw an equivalence between the two equal alternatives. She thought that the examination of the interior, the search for the self, mattered too. I think both insights offer, and in both off responses offer an important insight. Two different ways to illuminate, or perhaps two differently focused illuminations. One orientated towards the problem of knowledge beyond ourselves, and the other towards the problem of knowledge within ourselves. We're in the territory of the public good of education, but also its role in people's personal meaning and indeed its relationship to traditions of sense making. What is it that the pupils are taking away in terms of making sense? And might we prefer certain takeaways over others? Beghini's conclusion is that to understand their authenticity, we need to know how truths are held within networks of other truths, which are mutually supporting. He writes, belief in the scientific evidence for evolution, for example, depends on belief in the general uniformity of nature over time and space, the ability of human beings to be able to see reality accurately and to understand it, properly, the integrity of academic science and scientists. His point is that we arrive at truth holistically within a web of associated supporting truths. So it's not enough to confront a truth standing alone if we want to understand its authenticity or indeed what it means. We need to read the network it sits in, the pattern around it. Beghini's philosophical reflection is like the psychological insight from atheist Jewish moral psychologist Jonathan Haidt's moral foundations theory from his book, The Righteous Mind. He argues that to understand how people reach wildly different beliefs, you need to see 
the things they hold most sacred fit into their matrix of practices and intuitions. For hate, intuition comes before reason. Put another way, reason works in the service of that which we already intuit. This has implications for education in general, but specifically for religious education. To make sense of a person's point of view is to understand, to stand under another, close to the place where they stand. To attend to them and make effort to read through their matrix of meaning. Discern the values they hold sacred and the pattern around so that we can strive to see things from where they are. This is not the same as the study of reasons or the process of reasoning. For the last few years, there's been a great deal of in-subject RE talk about its next regeneration, with the game-changing proposal to revision it for the needs of a 21st century with an emphasis on worldview. This is especially important given the rapid changes in belief and practice among young people. The RE conversation has moved on and now needs to address a less religious UK, but a more religious London and an increasingly more religious world. The Nobody Stands Nowhere animation was created by animator Emily Down um, with myself and Trevor Cooling and the Christian think tank Theos and the Cullen St. Gabriel's Trust. The animation and link report have attracted public and academic attention. It's been watched by as many as now 36,000 individuals. Um, it's clearly hooked into something. In summary, it depicts people perceiving the world in different ways from different perspectives through the lens of a camera or in conversation with one another from different vantage points. It poses existential questions throughout, metaphysical ones, but it doesn't offer answers. It was intended to generate discussion rather than advance a specific thesis apart from the one in the title. No one stands nowhere. There's a long and detailed conceptual debate about the history of the idea of worldview, and I'm going to sidestep that. Um, those debates are in the public domain and the professional education reports. Suffice to say, it's almost as problematic a concept as religion, and I think the change is not about that historic debate anyway. The worldview conversation is an attempt to shift the focus of RE. Currently, RE can and often leads towards the listing of propositions and the summarizing of positions based on beliefs. The emphasis on belief as the root of things is questionable. The case is eloquently summarized by John Gray in his Seven Types of Atheism, where he notes, the idea that religion is a matter of belief is parochial. What did the authors of the Bhagavad Gita believe? He asks. The web of traditions described by Western scholars of Hind as Hinduism has no prescribed creed. Gray continues, the notion that religions are creeds, lists of propositions or doctrines that everyone must accept or reject emerged with only with Christianity. Belief was never as important as observant in the Jewish religion. Christianity has been a religion of belief from the time it was invented, but there have been Christian traditions in which belief is not central. Eastern Orthodoxy holds that God is beyond human conception, a view fleshed out in what is known as negative or apathetic theology. The 13th century Catholic theologian Thomas Aquinas was explicit that God does not exist in the same way that any particular things exist. If God is the grounding of reality, then God cannot be real in the way that reality is real. It must be something more or other than that. Now, that might seem strange to believe if you are familiar only with the tradition where propositions are central. But what he says is not controversial. If you come from a tradition where practice comes first, how we teach our children in schools does look distorting. Religion is more composite, being, belonging, behaving, and believing. It's in a matrix of meaning around core foci of ultimate sacredness. So words like the language or grammar of meaning used sometimes in RE scholarship, such as Thomas Groom 
are better, I think. In RE Today, the worldview conversation is seeking to move closer to this sense, the sense of learning a language. The new conversation is attempting to ensure there is something rich and meaningful for every pupil, and so should address the crisis of sense-making. This is important not only because of the loss of confidence around truth, but what that loss is doing in impacting behaviour and the sense of belonging. But before I come on to that, it's the idea which actually came up, I think, in a conversation I was having with Barry Billingsley, that that RE might have a service to play for the whole school curriculum around sense making because it maybe has the space to do that. So meaning comes in layers, not just binaries. A curriculum that is making sense rich as well as knowledge rich could help with the sense making crisis. But to achieve this in a way that de escalates the culture of binary arguments means changing our patterns of analysis to something that, whilst remaining intellectually developmental, is also more good-natured. The crisis of behaviour and belonging is one of conduct and connectedness. It's in our social media, politics, seemingly everywhere else. It's a proliferation of winner-loser, polarising debates or arguments with associated behaviours and the consequent emotional impact of experiencing those debates and their outcomes. There is a virtual blood sport dimension to this that includes a new set of blasphemies, social media shaming and outing, leading to the extremes of virtual mob witch hunts. Disinformation, misinformation can spread like wildfire. This expresses itself in bad faith arguments where opponents are cast as heinous evil, where the things that the wrong people value are not even granted the status of value, and where cynicism seems to have terrible consequences. Social media systems facilitate both the battleground and the creation of doctrinally pure echo bubbles with strong protective walls. This is a long way from the desert tradition of open hearth hospitality. The tradition referred to in the ancient Hebrew text where a vulnerable Abraham welcomes three utterly unknown strangers into his tent and feeds them and looks after them. It's a desert tradition. You meet your enemy, you put tribal hostilities aside when you're in the desert because the desert is the common enemy of all. That was the shared understanding. And you hope that if you meet a stranger in the desert and you have water, you share it with them so that perhaps when they meet you and you have none, they will share it with you. In England, as pupils study, Ofsted expects them to remember more and to get better at practicing something in each discipline. What should they practice? If a pupil in science practices being a science, and if a pupil in history practices being a historian, what does a pupil in RE practice? An answer is that a pupil practices at being an accurate, critical, wise, and reflexive interpreter, according to one Trevor Cooling. And I think this can happen in three levels. Practice the tradition's way of interpreting. Practicing interpretation of the traditions they study. But also practicing personal interpretation of the human condition they find themselves in. To achieve this requires some change in tack from the current religious studies examination practice, which is so dominant in secondary RE, particularly around its approach to text which is easy to illustrate in one example. I remember watching a lesson where a student had just been praised for being able to identify quotes to support both the argument that Christians might damage the world through having dominion over it, and how they may be good stewards or good shepherds of it. Having quoted two texts and received teacher's praise, he sat down, muttering to his mates, there you are, Bible's completely contradictory as usual. Without some sense of education in biblical interpretation, teaching students to argue from multiple perspectives implicitly teaches them that the text is arbitrary, so involving it in moral decision-making, pretty unwise. For many years, textbooks and examinations have emphasized the use of fragments of text to uphold reasons and arguments. 
Right now, students, like my daughter, are required to know quotes and use them in arguments, irrespective of whether the way of sense making is that which their tradition practices or the tradition they're studying. Currently, the way of sense making that is sacred to the exams involves proof texting. Proof texting is a feature of the science versus religion worldview binary debate. McGilchrist characterizes this as a Victorian debate that seems to have become stuck. As arguments were offered to explain things with evidence as the justification of reasoning, so some religious thinkers took an approach to Bible interpretation that was very similar. You bring up the sacred text as an alternative set of evidence and then use it to prove things. That fits the Twitter culture today. But while you encounter fragments, you miss the narrative, the context. You get the headline, but not the story. You learn the phrasebook language, but you don't know the grammar. Exam boards guided by the quality office can form all argument into a standardizable format for equivalent comparability in the assessment. It's just that in this case, they've taken sense-making practice by one group and transposed it across the whole field. This approach has been baked into the religious studies examination system. The sense-making of the discipline required of students studying any religion is descended from a quite particular approach, which happens to depart mainstream sacred text scholarship. So much for disciplinary knowledge in the curriculum. This is a particularly grievous thing to have done, given that Protestant sacred text scholarship is sophisticated. It's engaged with by many, discipline, uh, by many denominations across the Christian world. It's also been influential in philosophical hermeneutics. It's also been influential in hermeneutical practices in other religious traditions. Never mind. Currently, RE examinations engage plurality and diversity in exams in a particular way which encourages position taking and debating. This is not the only requirement for students, but it constitutes half of all the marks and is the high point as all other question types lead to this. In other words, the quality assurance process has resulted in an intellectual, intellectually questionable structure being imposed where a discipline should in fact be. Rejecting the language of war in argumentation. The practice of argumentation as the highest point of education for RE well, there are some dangers here. Argumentation can become, can become a kind of sophistry performance, a classic TV courtroom style, or Prime Minister's questions, indeed. Uh, Nigel Fancourt and Leon Grilliford of Oxford University, in a recently published article, show that perspective taking, taking is something students really struggle with. Psychological research suggests that this is very difficult for anybody to do. Hate suggests it's very hard for a person to make the case for something they lean away from. It's easier to defend where we are than where we are not. The binary form of argument is hardly for the sake of heaven. Former Chief Rabbi Jonathan Sachs tells of the ancient Jewish account of damage done by winner-loser arguments with no concern for the aftermath resulting in situations where neither side ever wanted to speak to one another again. In fact, the uh, Jonathan Haidt that I've been referring to quite a bit makes a very similar case, concluding his book with a chapter, Learning to Disagree Better. And a parallel case is within Ian McIlchrist. The aim of the binary arguments in the exam is, I suggest, to be right better. Build better chains of reasoning that lead to compelling winning answers. Of course, we want students to learn good argumentation. The case is whether this practice, this kind of practice in RE, well, what does it do to how we're trying to do diversity and plurality? Does it do diversity and plurality well? The justification to put the conflict model at the heart of the RS exam has now, I think, expired. It looks like a game of worldview battle, where traditions are towers of community in contest with one another. And I don't see how winner-loser conversations are particularly good for diversity and plurality and in RE, and in fact, could indeed encourage bad faith dialogue. I'm not convinced about the wisdom of directing students of religion to mainly focus on disagreement. 
If victory is the target, how can the realisation of any possible reframing be contemplated seriously? You have to remain defiant that you are right to withstand your opponent. Cognitive linguists have long noted that there is a metaphor of warfare in the English idea of debate. In 1980, Lakoff and Johnson, Metaphors We Live By, they demonstrated how metaphors shape our thoughts through and around language. A metaphor is not a, just a particular part of a sentence, but part of the imaginal field in which we think and interpret. The first example in their book is an example of how the language of argumentation is the language of war. Your claims are indefensible. This is a quote. He attacked every weak point in my argument. His criticisms were right on target. I demolished his argument. I never won an argument with him. If you disagree, okay, shoot. If you use that strategy, he'll wipe you out. He shot down all of my arguments. So, our religious studies question design leads us close to using metaphors of war to speak about religion and belief, unless we deploy a significant amount of reframing for that experience. Lakoff and Johnson contrast the kind of complexity that is possible through warlike debate with that that is possible through dance. And they ask, could metaphors of debate be more dance-like than warlike? If we want to go deeper than superficial binaries and encourage a more intelligent and civil argumentation that is open to synthesis, then sense-making will need a more refined set of tools to discern layers of meaning. Nuance, context, complexity. I've concluded that hermeneutics is a key way to achieve this in the study of religion and worldviews, and it locates RE in the study of those texts held to be sacred. Hermeneutics offers a pathway of stage development of understanding through interpretation to engage with the layeredness, the multidimensionality of meaning. I think it offers a way of understanding the grammars of meaning going on, and it at least treats the texts held sacred of people in traditions much better than proof texting. To this, we could add understanding religious reading practices, of course, how it works out in the life of people um, in traditions, even song, Gregorian chant, liturgical expression, the organization of church life. Our study, texts and teachers, found a deeper encounter with structures of meaning and the ways of knowing practiced by traditions could be accompanied by, could be accomplished by serving teachers, by adopting specific aspects of hermeneutics in their teaching, and at the same time contributed to richer exam questions. Although, to be fair, what it also did was realize early on that the kinds of discussions going on in year seven superseded the GCSE examination expectation for four years later, probably wouldn't fit the mark scheme. A good natured inquiry. What kinds of questions might we focus RE on to ask pupils to practice? What about a focus on human collaboration rather than mainly disagreement? Are there not interfaith organizations that champion collaboration? The news footage of Grenfell the day after the fire didn't show faith communities fighting over each other to help the survivors, but rather the extraordinary cooperation in response and the unity of the, hope, the human spirit despite tradition differences for the common good. Would our difference trained RS students have been able to make sense of the common good that these communities found they could offer? Scholars of Christian education have explored question structures that promote service for others, the common good around virtues of service, welcome, generosity. We could teach ethics with the work of health carers and counsellors in mind, where the guide is a nurse to help navigate life's proclivities, rather than be right better. What about a focus on synthesis, such as that which people like Ian McGilchrist argue for? Could we teach students that the encounter of difference is sometimes not an indication that one is wrong and the other right, but that a bigger integrating picture might be there? This might contribute to the civic objective of education for a more open society. The Church of England spends a lot of time trying to reconcile contrasting matters. Jonathan Sachs recalls the philosophical insight established in the Jewish tradition that oppositional positions 
could be both words of God. Currently, it's not clear that pupils would understand the distinctiveness of the patterns of meaning that led communities to areas of commonality and synthesis. There just aren't questions about that. We're not asking students to identify those and see how it can be possible that different traditions reach common approaches to the alleviation of suffering, for example, that's fundamental to Red Cross, Red Crescent. We're not they're not practicing those kinds of questions. What about argumentation that sought to promote golden bridge building? Building bridges between contrasting viewpoints. What if we reward specifically synthesis, common ground finding, and the practice of disagreeing well? <laughs>